market today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what, are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves, or is there really something here? And the answer is, most likely there is something there. And most likely, maybe that they were the original Israelites, and maybe that the Jewish people today who are white Caucasian people um, came in a little bit later on. We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. You have a man named Unculus who, who wrote a commentary on the Torah, unprecedented, that we still learn today. He was a convert. Some of the largest pillars on the transmission today were Roman converts. So here we are, we're, you know, I'm speaking, we're Caucasian Jewish people. And now you have people in Africa saying that they're the real people of Israel. It can't be ruled out at all. We know they were sold into slavery. We know now that they're fulfilling prophecies by saying we're coming back. Rabbi Harry Rosenberg, how are you doing, sir? I am feeling very grateful. Thank you. How are you doing? Listen, I, I, I'm doing good. I want to really thank you for joining me today um, on the rematch on basketballnews.com and Fly TV. Now, this is a very important discussion um, with everything that's going on with Kyrie Irving and, you know, um, Hebrews to Negroes and everything. Um, but let's 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 talk a little bit about you, um, if we could. Could you um, introduce yourself, if that's OK? And you're live from Jerusalem, right? Correct. I'm in Jerusalem right now. Right, right, right. So talk about everything that you do there. I was looking at your bio and you do so much amazing work. Um, yeah, so just let the people know everything that you do. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, just born and raised Queens, New York. Went to public school. Joined uh, my you know ancestral religious identity later on in life when I joined Yeshiva. Started studying Torah. Um, you know, out of the gates, I became a social entrepreneur. So I founded an online university teaching theology. And I got a farm in Israel where we're practicing sustainable living and healing to restore people to their ancestral way of uh, thinking, mm -hmm. a healthier way than we're currently living in America 2022. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to just push forward the agenda of my ancestors of world peace and a global ingathering of the tribes of Israel right now. That's where I found sanity in my mind. Now, I was reading about your connection with Amari Stoudemire before we get into everything. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, very simple relationship. You know, my friends, um, we were we were very interested in him. Uh, you know, when he started talking about being from the House of Israel, we were very excited by the idea of this uh, unity between these two communities. And uh, so one of my friends tweeted him. Amari tweeted right back. It was something about biblical prophecy, and that's how you got Amari's attention back then. And, you know, he mm -hmm. tweeted back. And he was just like, oh, listen, I'm down to study. Let's build. I want to see what's going on. So we got together in New York City. We started studying some Torah together. And he's a very spiritual person. So he was just interested in as much Torah as he could study. So my relationship with him for the last 10 years is just strictly Torah study. You know, and he's got now dozens and dozens of Torah study rabbis and partners from all spectrums. He's studying everything he can. So for me, I enjoyed the intellectual pursuit, uh, working with him, learning from him, us learning together from our sages. And mm -hmm. we kept it spiritual since day one. That's great. That's great. And I also saw that you took the Marleys on a tour of Jerusalem. Tell, can you tell me about that, too? Well, we were definitely there for a tour together. And uh, the Marleys identify and believe in the spiritual system of uh, Ethiopian and Haile Selassie which traces back to direct male descendants of King David's line from King Solomon. So all of a sudden you have this King Solomon spirituality that's flourishing in these communities. And now they're back in Jerusalem mm -hmm. feeling, you know, this ancestral vibe and it's just so emotional. So going around there with them and just feeling what they were feeling vicariously through them was just incredible, an incredible experience to see. You know, because it's like AM, FM radio. When you're going to Jerusalem, you're going under the Temple Mount and you're exploring tunnels that King Solomon and his guys were building. There's another feeling you can't describe. And just to see that going through them, coming from that school of thought from the House of David, was very humbling for me. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That sounds like an amazing trip. Now, you grew up 
um, a basketball fan. I saw a picture with you with John Stark. So you grew up a Knicks fan? Because I grew up a Knicks fan too. So you know what I mean? We had that in common. Uh, yeah, it's a very funny thing that you mentioned that. I did grow up a Knicks fan. I got to meet John Starks at a young age, which was really exciting for me. I guess it was a foreshadow of some relationships that were to come. Right. And um, But you didn't have an option growing up. I, I went to public school, you know, so I was mentioning before to you, you know, I had my Shaq jersey, my Penny Hardaway jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, every day was a different jersey. It was the culture, you know, that was being brought down. Right. It was It was something you had to be, you're in or you're out, and you, you needed to be in. That's right. That's right. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, let's start with this question um, because there's so much I want to talk to you about, you know, before we get into um, Hebrews to Negroes and, you know, the, you know, the original chosen people and, you know, what the original Hebrews looked like and everything, that whole conversation. I want to start off with Kyrie Irving. Um, I think that's a good place to start. And I, I want to ask you your opinion of everything that has transpired. Um, and do, do you feel that he did something wrong? Do you feel that he's anti-Semitic? Do you think the word anti-Semitic is being used a little bit loosely here? Like, what what what, what are your thoughts um, in general? I mean, yeah, so Kyrie Irving seems to me, you know, just from following him in the headlines for all these past years, as a very spiritual person seeking truth and spirituality. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the hat he seems to be wearing. So everyone just, first of all, has to give someone like that credit. You know, he could be going to the clubs and partying and doing all the hedonistic things the American lifestyle tries to promote. Right. And yet he's trying to get to the bottom of what's going on in reality. So that's an amazing thing. And I think that needs to be always supported and embraced and never ignored. You know, it's mm-hmm. dangerous to, to ignore people like that and to ignore their voices and to silence them. There should be, always be a conversation. So I think he's looking, you know, and, and, you know, I'm still looking. Everyone's still looking. So where I am now is not where I'm going to be in five years or in 10 years. I'm Hopefully I'm going to level up in my awareness and my knowledge. Mm-hmm. So we don't judge a man for where he is now because they're on a pursuit towards something. So you have to give everyone space towards that. Where it got a little sticky was he, you know, he made a post of a documentary that um, that had a lot of things in it that, triggered the Jewish community, um, right, rightfully so, because the documentary claims that they're imposters and they're, they're not the real inher- you know, inheritors of what they've just died for for the last 2,000 years to preserve in this uh, dark exile. So because he did that, and then, and then like maybe he was willing to even talk about it and understand where in this documentary they were making up things that weren't real. Um, but no, but everyone came at him with the claws, and that was like, wait, wait a minute, I can't free think. I can't speak. I can't. So then it just, it wasn't about the documentary anymore. Now it became about something much bigger, but you didn't have to escalate to this. All it had to be was a few smart people to watch the documentary, tweet Kyrie back, like, hey, these guys said X, Y, Z. Here's some inaccuracies with this. Um, What do you think about it now? Instead of just labeling him and canceling him, it's just, uh, it's got a sour taste to it. Something's off. Uh, I definitely agree. You know, I, I, I think that anything is worthy of a discussion, um, but it seemed like there was no discussion with this. They just, uh, you know, they just wanted him to, you know, denounce it, delete it, apologize, apologize again and apologize some more. You know, and I was like, well, wait a minute now. Let's have a discussion and, and separate a little bit about what you what problem, because the, 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 the documentary is three and a half hours long. Um, it's three and a half hours long. There's a lot going on in the documentary. So I think you could at least have a discussion to kind of decipher which ones are worthy of a discussion, which ones do you not believe in, which one. And I thought that he said in the initial um, press conference, specifically that he did not agree with the entire documentary, but he was sharing it for the information. And I, for me, I didn't think that there was anything wrong with sharing something for the information. I know he didn't give it context, but after the first press conference, I kind of thought he did. What, what, what was your what was your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's nothing wrong with sharing something for the information, but you have to also take responsibility. When you're a man who's got a blue check and you got followers and you're a role model, you got to watch and vet thoroughly before you promote something, before you put your name on it. So, you know, I, think, I do think there's a level of responsibility if you're going to post something. You have to know exactly what you're posting and you got to be able to stand behind it and defend it if you want. You can't say... 
I saw parts of it, and I just think everyone else should do that. Listen, you know, you, you're a man of influence. You have to use that strategically. It can cause a lot of chaos. So I think that he wields a powerful weapon, and um, I don't want to turn him off from using that weapon because of, you know, people calling him anti-Semitic and attacking him. But that's just not the way to go about this, you know, from both ends. You know, he may have, you know, should have reconsidered learning about it before posting it, perhaps. And the people who reacted should have just, well, listen, there's an elephant in the room. We're like ignoring the main topic over here, which is much bigger than if he's an anti-Semite or not, is did these Israelites come to America on these slave ships? And is there a, like a, an in-gathering redemption story going on here where the God of Israel is making going to make his name known to the whole world? There's something much bigger going on here. Definitely. And I think it's just so much easier to brush it under the rug. But whoa, 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 we're not interested in redemption stuff. We're not interested in you joining. Like, we're just shutting it down because it's triggering someone who's uncomfortable with this greater ingathering, which to me is the red flag. The red flag is that there's not newspaper articles saying, wait a minute, there's, an, you know, there's tribes in Africa practicing Judaism, working with the government of Israel, and they came on ships to America. And what in the world is going on? How is that not the main topic of discussion? So, so that's why quickly, when I talk to my Jewish brothers and sisters, you know, at the Shabbat table, and everyone's trying to go, oh, Kyrie anti-Semite, this, that, I'm like, wait a minute, guys, don't you see something much bigger is happening? And after talking it out, you know, the Jewish people like that I get to speak to, they they calibrate their eyes to see what's really going on, that there's a much bigger picture. And for them, it gives them a little bit of hope and excitement that there's going to be a happy ending, uh, you know, to this whole story. So, I mean, I, and, I, and I hear you, but I don't quite see that as far as being the desire of a lot of the powers that be um, in the NBA right now because it seems like they just want to squash the entire topic and not have a conversation and not coming to a happy ending um for him to just denounce everything and and the six steps that he has to do before he can come back to the nets that's a tough pill to swallow i have to be honest with you that's a lot of stuff that they want him to do what was your reactions to the to the six steps well, obviously, the you know the NBA is a private business, so they can do whatever they want. He can choose to have that job and make that money, or he could choose to not. So that's the beautiful thing about America being a free country. So yeah. he, you know, it's it's not about really what's fair or not; it's what they want, and and that he's got to play ball or not play ball with it. You know, personally, if it was me, and it was that bank, I'd be like, all right, I'm gonna stay quiet for another year or two, make some money, then I'm gonna come back out and fight strong. You know, but. I, I'm not him. I can't judge. And I don't even know if that's how I would react. But um, at the end of the day, you know, making him sit down with a rabbi and doing all these things in a pub, we've seen this before. This is not the first rodeo where they're making a guy sit down with a rabbi and apologize because he did send something, quote unquote, potentially anti-Semitic. So I'm like, first of all, I was like, I I I'm a rabbi. Let me <laughs> let me sit down with him. That would be their worst nightmare. That would be yeah. uh, an absolute mess for the, the Jewish, uh, you know, powers that be in the NBA when they realize that there's Jewish people waiting for this unification and this is just the calling out for a cry for like a spiritual um, bond that's manifesting. So I think that the, the conditions they gave them, standard status quo, what they do to people in these situations hasn't worked in the past and it's not going to work going forward. But um, hopefully if we can be strategic, we can take advantage of this opportunity put him in touch with the right rabbis and make some power moves. I think that's an interesting notion that you said as far as putting him in touch with the right rabbis. And what I what I heard from the language that they want him to be lectured, not necessarily for someone to have a conversation with him. Like I don't I didn't I didn't take from that that somebody wants to listen to him. Um I could be wrong, but I I, I didn't I didn't get that you know from their mandates. And, you know, can you really get to any resolve without an actual conversation? Or is it just an actual lecture mandate? You apologize, you denounce, you accept this, you denounce this, and then we move forward. Yeah, well, some of the lecturing, I think, is somewhat potentially necessary because if this does, like, the regular Jewish person that you see walking in the street, they don't have anything to do with this. They don't have anything to do with the NBA, with any global conspiracies. These are simple beautiful, good people trying to keep the commandments and live their best life. And when things like this come about, there is always a rise in uh, attacks, violent physical attacks on Jewish people. 
Um, I'm, you know, I'm, since I'm in the community, I get a lot of it. It comes to me. I see what's going on. I hear it. It's behind the scenes a lot of it. You don't get, you don't see it reported. And the Jewish people feel threatened and feel scared for their safety because of the the environment that gets created around these scenes. Meanwhile, these civilians on the ground have nothing to do with it. So you do have to lecture a little bit and say, hey, this is life or death. This is actually a very dangerous thing. People are responding to this topic physically and violently, and it's putting people at danger. So that's really serious, you know? Um, so we have to be very cautious about that and how we go about that. So to, you know, to respond to that, I would say that things are very dangerous for black people in this country as well. Um, I just did an article with Emerald Garner, who is um, Eric Garner's daughter. And she talked about how her father, Eric Garner, was um, murdered by New York, New York Police Department um, officer, Daniel Pantaleo. And broad daylight, it was on video, everybody saw it. And he didn't have to go through any steps to be able to come back to the force. Now I know those are two different things because one is a private entity of the NBA, but but as far as as, as on principle, like he didn't even have to apologize to the family of the man that he murdered. Like he didn't have to do anything. And she wrote, I just you know co-wrote her her book with her, and she talked about how painful it was driving around afterwards and just seeing him, you know, on the same beat, you know, with with different you know police friends and laughing and joking like nothing ever happened and how terrified she felt, how scared she was for her life, like what was going to happen next, you know, the entire atmosphere. So when you're talking about it and looking at it from those terms, because, you know, I, and you always have to look at from other people's eyes, there's a lot of fear going on, but it appears as though, you know, that one side is never given the dignity of, of having to do everything that Kyrie has to do to come back and play basketball. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, not only do I understand it and I agree with it, but I just want to clarify my point, because mm -hmm. not to take away from the incredible state of disaster, you know, of how the African-American community is being treated in America and what happened to them and what's going on. I can't even possibly begin to even understand that. I would need to be lectured on that properly to even fully understand how it feels for, for this community. But what I was just trying to say is, yes, so the violence and these attacks that are coming towards the Jews, these Jewish people, the Jewish people in general, have nothing to do with this, really. They're simple, loving, humble, caring people who only want goodness in the world. There's a hierarchy power that is not connected to the commandment-keeping, you know, religious, orthodox, Jewish community. And we have to learn to separate who, the, who these people Kyrie has really got an issue with, who his issue is with, and it, it shouldn't have to do with regular day, you know, guys in Brooklyn trying to run to their synagogue to prayers on time and worry about maybe getting punched in the face or their hat knocked off and called a dirty Jew. So so I'm, I'm not taking away from what's going on in your community. And you're right, the, the officer should have to do not six things. He shouldn't have to ever be an officer again, you know, right. but, but there should be an equal response. But I'm just trying to separate entities within the Jewish people there are some guys there at the top that we could discuss and what's going on. And then there's just the people. And the people are beautiful people that shouldn't get confused with uh, any powers to be in America right now. So you did a little bit of, well, a little bit what's happening. Maybe, I'm sure it was unintentionally, but the, um, kind of conflating two different issues of one being Kyrie and one being Kanye. So Kyrie didn't really talk about the the other um, or identify the, the group that is the you know problematic group of the group in power that you're referring to um but but kanye did so what you said was a little bit more of what his point was but i want you to go a little bit more into detail as far as what do you mean because i i do understand what you're saying um as far as there being a difference between the regular commandment trying to fulfill um you know every day um person and the power structure that does have a dark side to it. Um, and those are that was the strong reaction that Kanye, you know, received from that, uh, amongst other things. And I don't want to, you know, get far too off and go into Kanye because there's a lot of different issues going on with there with mental health and everything else going on. But but as far as the separation of the two, 
I want to go a little bit details of that, if you could, because a lot of people don't understand that um, that distinction. Whew, two things. Um, one is that I just want to make it known today in America, the Jewish people are losing more Jews to assimilation than they did in that died in the Holocaust. So that means more Jews are marrying out of Judaism, forgetting that they're even Jews a generation or two later, than the six million that perished in the Holocaust. So that means to say that there's two types of Jews out there today, really. And, you know, because I have love for all the types of Jews, they're, they're my people. Um, but there's two types of Jews. There's Jews who are keeping commandments and passing them on to their children and making sure their children will pass them on to their children, as we've been doing for thousands of years. And then there's unaffiliated, totally secular ones who don't know, you know, the Hebrew alphabet, don't know who Moses' children's name were, all that. And they raise their kids to, you know, go to public school, go to college, and their kids come home with non-Jewish spouses and end up having Christmas trees in their house and, and have their kids who, you know, maybe will remember a, a Yom Kippur and their kids forget about it. They're not even going to be Jewish. This is what's happening nowadays. So it seems to be that all this Jewish energy in Hollywood and this elite and ruling these people have allegiance to something else besides the Torah. This is not a Torah-backed, bound uh, group of humans. Yeah, they may give a lot of charity to Israel and visit Israel and love it. These aren't individuals who are necessarily raising children in the tribe in the mindset that you are a Jew. They're, uh, they have allegiance to something else that could be much you know, darker fraternity-wise, that has rituals and, and all these type of things that you know Kanye was talking about. And mm -hmm. that shouldn't be uh, com confused with... The Jewish people's pursuit for a, a homeland and a redemption and an in-gathering for the tribes. So those are two separate things. You know, and as we spoke about before, this is, you know, a little bit controversial on my end, but they can't really cancel me for saying this because this is something that the Jewish people believe. But uh, my ancestor, a great rabbi, the Vilna Gon, you could actually see him and maybe in the picture right above my finger. Um, okay. He said that in the future, the final battle that the Jewish people had, he wrote this hundreds of years ago, and this is considered, you know, accepted by Jews worldwide. You can't argue with this, Rabbi. He said that the final battle that the Jewish people have to face is not going to be Ishmael, not going to be the Arabs, and it's not going to be Edom, it's not going to be the church and, and the Europeans. We, we, we went through those exiles already. He said the last exile is going to be from within the Jewish people, that we're going to have to fight an evil within us that that takes a position of power over the Jewish people and they don't represent Torah values and they spread uh, conflict in the world and the Torah to be forgotten. These are his words for verbatim. And so the Orthodox Jewish community in Israel, like the, the ones really dedicated to Torah study, they're aware of this teaching and they see it, you know, in their, in their redemption lens. They're looking at the world through this lens saying we have an evil within ourselves we have to purge so for a lot of the jewish community on the ground who are aware of this because most modern orthodox jews aren't even aware of this teaching because they just grew up to be you know automatically supporters of all the things that they were told to have to support but the people on the ground in israel a lot of us when we saw Kyrie and kanye coming out there we were like oh this could be exciting for us because now we could have allies in the fight on evil because these guys look like they're just looking to go for evil and so are we so we could have some allies but there's someone trying to keep us from building with each other you know some force that's just trying to silence them. like no don't don't link up and bro out with the guys on the ground don't don't collaborate you're punished you're silent get in the corner and so for us we're like you know there's so many jews praying that kanye gets in touch with the right jews because they could they would for sure work together to say all right, what's actually evil in the world and what's good in the world? Let's start to put it on the table and cleanse the situation. This is what we've been waiting for for hundreds of years. That's interesting, you know, and I've never heard anyone else say that before you, to be honest with you. Um, and and it, it, this goes to a another question as what is anti-Semitic? Because if I just said exactly the same thing that you just said verbatim, would I be labeled anti-Semitic? Right, that's why you need me on your team. I'll tell you why um, it's so dangerous, because this stuff, this type of thinking, leads to dangerous positions for everyday Jews, because people aren't able to differentiate. You know, whoever Hitler was looking for, whoever he had an issue with, with bankers, with the people manipulating Germany, he had some issues with some Jews, no question. 
he should have dealt with them in courts. Like, you didn't have to go after every single Jewish person. Don't bunch us all together. Okay. Um, but this is not a new thing that I'm telling you. This is a, one of the central core spiritual beliefs of Judaism um, that dates back 3,000 years with uh, what's called the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude. These were the Egyptian magicians that left Egypt with Moses in the desert. So if you look at the Torah, it says when the Israelites left, a group of Egyptians went out with them and they all converted. As we see, you know, conversion is part of the Torah. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that caused the sin of the golden calf. They did sorcery of magic, made this golden calf, caused the Israelites to sin. Moses breaks the tablets and all of a sudden we have to have a day of atonement to fix this whole scenario. And our ancestors warned us that these people that did the golden calf in the future are going to come back in a powerful position of leadership in the Jewish community with their Egyptian fraternity reality mindset and come in with and you know perpetuate a great evil and like you said if you said this you would be called anti-semitic for sure right but my, my great grandfather wrote this down so i want to know who's going to come up and, and talk to me about this because you can't you can't silence our ancestors and um, that's why it's imperative guys like kanye and Kyrie get in touch with the right jewish people to create a front of liberation to uh create goodness in the world you know we have to, we have so much evil in the world we have to be working together. Divide and conquer is the strategy we're up against, and we can't let it mess with us. Let, let me ask you this along those same lines. Um, a lot of people were upset, had strong reactions from the second um, press conference that Kyrie did, where they asked him, are you anti-Semitic? And he said, you know, something, I don't know the exact quote, but he said something along the lines of, I can't be anti-Semitic if I know who I am. You know, he said something along like, I, I am um, a Semite myself. And they just blew a gasket with that. They, they, and, I, and I was like, hmm, you know, I, I, I didn't really know why that created such a firestorm. But I want to get your opinion on that, because, especially because you've, you've, been, you've worked with Amari before. And I've heard what he has said as far as, you know, who he is on his journey. And it sounded like there was a little bit of correlation with what Amari, the journey that Amari was on and that Kyrie were, was on, um, going in a little bit deeper into why he said that he was Semitic. So what, what, is, what, is, what was your interpretation of that? Yeah, so a lot of Jews got a lot of their feelings hurt by all this. And, you know, I had to sit down, like I said, at a lot of Shabbat tables and break it to everyone. It's not what they think is going on. There's something else going on, which actually gives them consolation. Like, okay, I'm a little happier now that I get a bigger picture of what's really going on. But I guess let's say Semitic comes from the word shame, which was one of the children of Noah, which gave line to the house of Israel. So when you're anti-Semitic, you're anti this bloodline that led to the house of Israel. So right. he's saying, how could I be anti the bloodline that leads to the house of Israel if I myself am from this bloodline? And if right. you see like certain sects of Jews, they fight with each other. You know, this type of Jew doesn't believe in settling the land of Israel until the Messiah comes. This type of Jew does. And they go to, they, they call each other names and they, fa they're not calling each other anti-Semitic because they're both within this thing. They just got an issue with each other. Right. So, so Kyrie is saying now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Semite. So how could I be anti-Semitic? So two things. One is, I guess we just have to change the word, you know, to, um, you know, anti or, or let's say hateful against the remnants of the Judeans from the second commonwealth, you know, make a new term for that, because let's be very specific with what's getting offended and who, who feels unsafe by people's statements. But let's say I'm sitting at a Shabbat table with a bunch of Jews who are super offended by him and they're triggered. I just have to explain to them, be like, hey, wait a minute, guys, time out. According to the government of Israel's website, the Ministry of Diaspora, they're listing the Igbo tribe as the seed of Israel, who is now, you know, has 60 Orthodox synagogues, and they're learning Torah, and they're flourishing. And these individuals, they have the term Zeri Israel, the seed of Israel on them. And, you know, they made up all, you know, a third or quarter of the transatlantic slave trade. So this blood from them has flown throughout the whole African-American diaspora. So we believe spiritually, if someone has the soul of Israel in him, it's like, a, it's like a magnet that will go towards its source that they will also go towards their source. They will, in the future, return to the Creator. So what you're seeing now is symptoms of some type of Israelite soul yearning to return to the Creator of the universe, return to its inheritance of the Torah. 
And when you explain it to people, that's what's going on in Kyrie's brain, and it's connected to a much bigger phenomenon called the ingathering of the house of Israel, which is a prerequisite to the redemption, according to the Jewish people. We just have to really understand what's going on. So, there's so the media really, I think, is the one like confusing everyone. If the media just said what I said and like took it like this, um, it would be so much easier. And I know Amari Stoudemire is now uh, launching very shortly an online course on this topic. So people can get, you know, accurate information from the Torah, from sources, from historians of what's going on across the Silk Road and in Africa and this. And how does that synchronize with the legends and the prophecies? And how do we make this all work for world peace? So I think there's going to be a great clarity that's going to come to this whole picture. But it's imperative the players on the ground stay connected and unified in the meanwhile and not, like I said, get divided through the conquer strategy. And, and to your point, I think that the media does a really great job of dividing. Um, you know, from the beginning, the attacks on Kyrie of being anti-Semitic were so strong and it was so all across the board of the media. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like just one. So, so usually with athletes, there's usually a few key people, and I don't have to necessarily call their names, that usually has a, a, a great time uh, it seems, um, attacking different athletes, especially when they speak out on anything. Uh, but with this topic, it was almost as if collectively as a whole, the media was kind of on one accord um, of saying, shame on you, Kyrie, um, you're anti-Semitic, film is anti-Semitic, you need to grovel before you can come into the good graces and you're wrong for this. And, and I was just like, wow, that's, that's a lot. And and I, I just I just wonder, you know, as far as the anti-Semitic bucket that a lot is being thrown into, you know, what conversations do people feel are off limits? And 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 that's that's an issue with me because in my opinion, I don't think anything should be off limits, but I think that there's so many things that are included in this anti-Semitic bucket. Um, it becomes really problematic. Yeah, I mean, listen, the Jewish people have had a dark 2,000-year history of rape and pogroms, and we couldn't even own land in Europe, and we didn't have rights, you know, forget anything. We were treated as the lowest class of citizens a human could be considered, and there's a lot of trauma in that. And, you know, I'm grateful that my people worked very hard. They came to America. They got wealth. They got power. And they said, don't mess, don't mess with us. You know, you keep my name out of your mouth. And to one angle, that's like very cool, you know, that we've established a, a system. Imagine how cool it would be that any time someone said a racial slur against the African-American, you guys were one united front with all your capital going to one non-for-profit dedicated to like making sure everyone respects your names. Um, it's something cool to that. But in this case, it didn't warrant necessarily the full force of what came his way but you can't walk around suggesting that the Jewish people are a nation that hijacked the identity of someone else and that they're you know imposters that's just not gonna fly like you you want to say that you're gonna get shut down um, so so that was just what happened and 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 if he wasn't from this whole narrative of the house of Israel with the transatlantic slave trade and the tribes in Africa, there would be actually, it would be like, okay, you know, you're just spewing, but there's something bigger going on here. So I think we have to look past the the silencing and, and just go right into the conversation of what's happening with the ingathering of the House of Israel. It's a spiritual thing going on here. But in order to be able to differentiate into what exactly is the the um, belief of Kyrie Irving, there has to be a discussion to be had. I mean, it just seemed like a lot of people just kind of jumped to... Oh, yeah. Kyrie Irving having certain ideas, thoughts, conclusions that he never said. So a lot of the things that he said in the first part, the, the very first um, press conference was that I, I love all religions. I respect all religions. I'm on a journey. I shared it for the information. I don't agree with everything in the film. Now, yes, could he be in, could have been a little bit more specific about what he agreed with and what he didn't agree with? Okay, I'll give you that. But he said he didn't agree with everything. So I just, I just thought that a lot of people um, really assign different beliefs to him that he never expressed. You know what? And by the way, people do that to me all the time. 
um, you know, because I'm very big on promoting and teaching about the idea of the Israel exile into Western Africa, into the Americas. And then someone will take a YouTube clip of me and say, you know, Rabbi Rosenberg says the blacks are the true Israelites and everyone else is. And I'm like, wait, I never said that. Just because you are didn't mean I'm saying I'm not also. So yeah. people, people take my words out of my mouth all the time. And I think you were 1000% right. This should have been an opportunity for dialogue. Someone could have just clearly said to him, listen, Kyrie, you know, as, as well as this documentary is put together, the history just is there. And if you look at the 2000 year history of the Jews uh, from Spain to Iran across the Silk Road and their contributions to society and their teachings and their legacy, you can't just say a people from the Northern Europe uh, took an identity and made it up. It's just it's a fallacy that could have taken a sentence or two to get past and move on and then have a conversation now about how we unite. Well, I, I, I don't think that you that everything in the video and the documentary had to be discounted because of the problematic areas, though. Um, I think that I, I, I and I have to admit, I still have about a half an hour to go with the documentary. It's literally three and a half hours. So it, it's a long documentary. But um, everything that I've seen, it's it's so. So let me let me let's go over a few things that were problematic, because I, I do want to get into particulars like to so what I've seen so far. Um, and there was, and you debated actually with the author of 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 Hebrews to Negroes, and maybe we could start there because I I um, I I commend you for having that discussion and that debate with someone who you um, disagree with. Number one, because that's something that we do not do in this society ever for whatever reason. People cannot have a civil discussion. I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know how civil it was. But I, I do want to see it. But let's talk about the, the issues that you had with the actual film. OK, great. Yeah, I did watch it over. And I think I could have been a little bit more respectful at certain points. You know, maybe got micro triggered here and there. OK. So I apologize if I was uh, rude or out of line or got, you know, a little uh, heated. Okay. But um, my, my point to him was just, you know, from day one that you did, you know, it's amazing what you've done that you could bring to light that this, you know, this diaspora reached America and this whole thing. But, you know, well, there's two things. First of all is the exclusivity. It's this concept that they keep using is the true Hebrews or the real ones or, and to imply that everyone else isn't, um, that seemed like a red flag to me. And my first question was, if you fulfilled this prophecy of Deuteronomy, they came to the ships on America as slaves, and it makes you the house of Israel, and that makes you the true Israelites according to what you're teaching. So what about all the millions of Igbos still in Africa today practicing Torah Judy, uh, and Jewish lifestyle according to the laws of Moses? Since they didn't come on ships, are they not, you know, since they don't fit the curses? You know, that's what people say on my profile. You know, you don't fit the curses, Rabbi Harry, so you're not from the real house of Israel because we fit the curses, so that makes us the real ones. So what about all the ones in Western Africa still there practicing Torah and religion? Are they not from the real house of Israel as well? And if they are from the real house of Israel, guess what? The exile went to four corners of the world. It, it spread across the Silk Road to India, and it went all the way north to the Black Sea, into the Germanic regions, and into uh, Morocco, and uh, all across. So one shouldn't have to cancel out the others. You don't see any other community in the Jewish um, world that wakes up and wants to rejoin his people say we're the real ones you're all fake so that so one let me, let me let me let me interject right there to just Please. um get a little bit of clarity so you're you're talking about the curses you're talking about the curse of ham um in no, not the curse of ham. okay what do you what do you what are you referring uh, the curse is that you will come to uh land not your own on ships and you will be slaves for 400 years okay all right got you got you i just want to be and make clarity yeah and these curses is what a lot of this um you know, quote unquote, the black Hebrew Israelites will, who are standing on the streets of Times Square will yell at you saying that, you know, we're the real ones because we fit the curses. It happened to us. It didn't happen to you. So you must be imposters. You're fake. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Um, besides yourself, um, have you heard any other rabbis acknowledge the Bantus or Igbo people as being part of, I mean, because what, what and, I, and I have to keep saying this because you're, and I looked at a lot of your videos that were on YouTube. And when I say that you're the only one that I've heard, 
um, even acknowledge a, a, a anything other than you are the chosen people and and not to even acknowledge any. So, so it's one thing to say, okay, you're, and, and I agree with you. That is definitely confrontational to say that, you know, you are imposters or you are, you know, the fake or you are the liars, but isn't it just as confrontational to not even acknowledge someone else's existence as even being, you know, worthy of acknowledgement? Yeah, well, two things. First of all, you see me being so proactive about this. Um, this was the work of my ancestors. So I come from a line of rabbis who actually wrote about this, were looking into this matter hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So yeah. something that I feel called to continue to do. Now, all the rabbis and most of the Jewish people today know about the Western African Jewish identity, the Igbo tribe specifically, um, namely because there's been articles about it, there's been things published about it, there's been documentaries made over and over. Uh, Israeli filmmakers were arrested in Nigeria last year going to make a documentary around it, and every single Jewish person in the whole entire Jewish world read in their front newspapers, you know, that the boys are arrested when they got freed and they were going to make a documentary in the tribes. So there should be no Jew today that really, really doesn't know about this, you know, except if they're not, if they're not, you know, if they don't have smartphones, if they don't have TV, some of these ultra-Orthodox don't have that type of stuff. Okay. But what they don't know is no one realizes that the transatlantic slave trade specifically came from these regions. And that's a jaw dropper for most of the Jewish people when I explain it to them and I let them know. Um, they don't, then, then once they do find out, it's like, wow, so what if, we don't even know what to do with that. You know, there's 100 million people today that say they're from the House of Israel, conservatively, that aren't Jewish. So from the Jewish people, they don't have an absolute idea of what to do with that. You know, however many, you know, 15 or so million Jews, I don't know exactly how many there are alive. There's like 100 million people that say they're from the House of Israel and want to come to Israel and take the land and be here. So it's like an overwhelming reality of what do we do next about this. But this is something that was spoken about for 2,000 years, these messianic times when the whole house of Israel starts to wake up and in gathers. And there is a roadmap that has to be followed of what should go down and how to unite us. And, uh, yeah, we need um, to have better branding and, and media around how to explain it, not just to the world, but to the Jewish people. So they shouldn't be so triggered when they see spiritual um, birth pangs coming out of this community who came from Western Africa where we're romanticizing about now. The Jewish people are like in love with this Western African Jewish identity. It's bringing so much diversity and, uh, you know, in this uh, newness and there's more than just to what we were used to. And it, they love it. You know, you'll see all the newspaper articles about it and it's just something we're aware of. Now we have to connect all the dots and to show there's no smoke without a fire. And uh, I hear you saying they love it and they're embracing it, but I haven't I heard too many of that, you know, maybe here in, in, in the States. Um, I really haven't. I've heard kind of the opposite that anything that so. So even going back to Kyrie, you know, one of the issues that people avoid kept saying about him saying I myself as a Semite, you know what I mean? I, I can't be anti-Semitic if I know where I come from. That was the problem. You know what I mean? Like and in, in it's it's. I hear what you're saying. But I kind of see the opposite here in the States as far as not even accepting a different a different um, belief or or integrating that belief in with theirs to be able to say, OK, well, if if, if the 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 the, um, the tribes went and dispersed all over the place. And, you know, that's one of the things in the documentary it talked about where it went to India it went to, you know, maybe a case for going to the, the Native Americans, went to um, the different parts of the Caribbean, everything like that. But I don't really hear that inclusivity that you're talking about. Um, you know, I, I kind of hear only the one side that no, that is us and that's it. In the discussion, anything else is anti-Semitic. Right, that's because there's a very big divide between your community and my community and there's this like big entity called media standing between us. Okay. But if, you, if you look into it, just, you know, the sign of the times, it was I think two nights ago, um, that filmmaker that got arrested in Nigeria, his name is Rudy Rothman. You can follow him on Instagram. He's a, uh, you know, a media guy, makes documentaries. He's full of love. He just did a whole tour throughout Africa filming Israelite communities. He mm -hmm. made a beautiful film on it. You know, I hope it gets to Netflix or something one day. But two or three days ago, he was just in the L.A. Jewish community 
very wealthy community with a sold out crowd and a movie theater type room showcasing this documentary. And you can look at his Instagram page and see the feedback and the comments from the Jewish people. Yeah. He gets rounds of applause, standing ovations. He makes people cry when they're watching this movie because it's pulling on their redemption strings. You know, the Jewish people are yearning for redemption. And this filmmaker, Rudy, is showcasing how the redemption's unfolding before our eyes. Look what's going on in these regions. And his first season was just focused on the African Israelite community. And so, yeah, for, I will say 100% sure from the Jewish people, there's a yearning for this unification and this ingathering. It just, there's, like I said, there's a media in between telling us that you guys think we're fake and there's animosity, and then telling you guys that, you know, you can't talk because we're going to call you anti Semitic. You can't express your spiritual beliefs about who you are. We'll call you anti Semitic. So, Ted, we're not going to call you anything. We're going to have a dialogue. That's what we want to do. But the powers that be, which seems to be my enemy and your enemy, I don't have a problem calling a Jewish person who's a power at B, who's manipulating media and creating, you know, um, a sickness in the mind of America, my enemy also. It doesn't make me anti Semitic. It just makes me, you know, it gives me the ability to have discernment. I'm able to discern who my enemy really is without using big, large, generic terms. I'm going to get more specific than Kyrie and Kanye with who my enemy is. And I think that's what we have to do. And, that, and that's part of the problem is that line that's divided. I mean, there have been discussions about, you know, a lot of the um, Jewish owned, say, for example, Jewish owned um, record labels in the music industry. And the, 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 the issue with that a lot of black people are, are, are now speaking a lot of more so than before, um, but a little bit more now is like, wait a minute now, would, would, would you allow negative images of, of your people to be promoted the way that you allow negative images of us, you know, of our women, of our, you know, just constantly being put out? I, and, and that's, I don't think that that question is anti-Semitic, but if proposed, by, a, by certain people is labeled as anti-Semitic. And I'm just using that as an example of, of the difficulties in even being able to have any type of a resolve between the black and the Jewish community because of that reason. And this has been going on for decades. This isn't like a new Kyrie issue or Kanye issue. This has been going on for decades, that strain. But I don't I don't know, right now it seems like the, the answer at least for the Brooklyn Nets and the NBA, is that you denounce, you apologize, and then we can move forward. Do you know what I mean? And I don't think that helps the bigger picture of, of healing that relationship. And you can tell me if you, you think otherwise. No, I agree with you 100%. That's, you know, that's just what's happening. And um, I think that, you know, first of all, yeah, it does seem very strange that the way success is promoted to an african-american male is you will get success either by being an athlete or a rapper that's where your wealth lies and one of them you know is you got to work for the you know the man and you got to keep your mouth shut and perform and right. the other one is a life of uh, promoting gangster living and drugs and and all this type of stuff and those are two very unhealthy things to say is your only option for success and to make that the the way people look up to it i think it's terrible how, you know, I don't think I would tolerate, you know, our Jewish woman being put on and, 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 you know, displayed in the way that it's getting displayed in your community. But at the same time, this really has nothing to do with the Jewish people as a whole and our pursuit for redemption. This seems to be, yes, could be all owned by Jewish people. Those guys have nothing to do with me, my community, and our pursuit for what we're trying to do for this ingathering. These are people, like I said, could very likely have Christmas trees in their house already by now. And their grandchildren are not can even have the name Jew on them, but they'll definitely be part of the same fraternity that their, you know, grandfather was or whatever college he went to and put, you know, that Greek stamp on him and pledge allegiance to something else, whatever it is. That could be the case. So I think we have to, like I said about discernment before, you know, you'd have to say, like, let's collaborate with the Jewish community and find out what's going on in the music industry that we're promoting such unhealthy living and, and thoughts that's polluting America's youth we got to collectively all focus on this. So the issue is not the Jewish people. It could be the Jewish, uh, you know, music guys who are doing it, but it's not the Jewish people. But even like you said, you couldn't be able to talk about that. This would be a very healthy outcome of a collaboration between our two communities because, you know, 
it's forbidden what they're doing. You can't display nudity and half naked women on TV. That's not modest. The Jewish right. people are a modest people. We walk modest, we dress modest, everything is modesty. So if one man makes a living by putting half naked people on TV, and then he goes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, is this a kosher living? The rabbi is going to say, This is not a kosher living. You're, not, you're, you're basically sinning in the eyes of God. You're not doing the right thing. So I have no problem calling out these individuals, but it's so much healthier for you not to have to do this alone, you know? For you to lock arms with leaders of the Jewish community to say yes. You know, if it's just a strange coincidence or, you know, if it's not that all these media companies are owned by wealthy Jewish men, we got to have an intervention. Be like, guys, you got to stop, uh, you know, taking advantage of the state of despair of this community and to showcase it to the world as entertainment and perpetuate it by making people think that this is how they're going to get success. And, um, and my heart goes out, I, you know, and I grew up listening to Notorious B.I.G., and Coolio and ODB, these are guys, because when in public school you have to, you don't have an option, that's the culture, mm -hmm. uh, for obvious reasons, because there's, a, as we spoke about before, there's a soul there, there's something there that no one else has, you know, that, that spark of creativity that stormed the world, and so we're into it, but um, something has to be done, something has to be done, it's a, it's a, a state that we can't go on any further, because I feel the pain when I read the comments and I see what's going on from your point of view. Um, I, I want to talk about a little bit more about the um, Bantu Igbo people, and I think that that you know they talked a lot about it in the film, and it, it's and like I said, you're the only person who I I saw even recognize or acknowledge. And that's a big that's a big thing. But as far as you know, what is your reaction? So in the one video that you referenced earlier where, and I saw that video where you were talking about it. You were talking about the Igbo people and you were talking about, you know, well, are they, you know, linked to this? And it sounded like, and I wanted you to tell me, it sounded like some people were getting up and leaving while you were talking. I could be wrong, but that's what it sounded like. So what is the, what is the reaction when you share this information um, with your fellow, fellow people? So funny you mentioned that because there was a video by the way, this is what started it all, because I was just minding my own business in a yeshiva giving a lecture about this topic, because this is what I lecture about, and they asked me to speak, so I said, okay. One of my rabbis told me, he says, anytime you talk publicly, make sure you have a professional mic and a camera and publish content, you know? So I was like, oh man, I'm speaking in yeshiva, I gotta call the cameraman or the mic man, and I filmed it for the first time, and, and I put it up there, and um, that's what led to the whole you know, debates and, the, and, and my position in the matter, I didn't realize how, how much it would affect the outside of the Jewish community world. I thought I was just talking to the Jews, but there was one moment in it where I was talking about the African-Americans from Igbo coming to America on the slave trade, and it sounded like a chair was moving. So a lot of the comments were like, oh, did someone get up and leave the room and here and there? And I want to say for the record that that didn't happen. No one left the room. Okay. And, um, you know, I've been talking about this for about 10 years already. And I've never triggered one Jew. And not only that, I speak to the, in Israel, we call it the, the gedolim, the, the sages, the great ones, you know, the great leaders of the generation who are, you know, 90-year-old men who, who know the whole Torah inside and out, backwards of their heads, and they're the lawgivers, and they're the most respected elders of the people. So in Jerusalem, they're like celebrities, you know, it's like catching like Kanye on the street, everyone taking the picture. So when you have one of these sages walking through the street, you'll see, you'll see hundreds of people following them trying to get a word with them. So I'm always strategic. Any single time I get one of these opportunities I'm walking by, I just throw myself in the middle of the circle. I go up to the rabbi, I say, you know, Shalom Aleichem, it's a pleasure to meet you. I greet him how Israelites greet each other. And I say, Rabbi, I'm involved in some interesting matters. These uh, people from around the world, they say they're from the house of Israel and they want to come back and they're, and they're these tribes and they have, they have these simonim, they have these signs, you know, they do eight day circumcision, they're not eating pig, they're doing Leverite marriage, they're doing all these type of things only found in the laws of Moses. And the rabbis always have the same reaction. They stop and their eyes open up with a state of wonder. And, um, you know, they give me such a blessing for success. Because the Jewish people have been in exile for so long. We had enough. We want to get out of this thing already. We're, we're totally sick and tired of this state of exile. And so I speak on behalf of the Orthodox Jewish community that the concept of the ingathering of the exiles and Israelites coming from all these different places of the world is the most exciting thing that could ever happen to us. And... I see it firsthand. I go around speaking in reform synagogues, conservative synagogues, modern orthodox synagogues, 
even Hasidic synagogues where they only really speak Yiddish and these guys, uh, you know, barely speak English so well, I have to come and explain to them what's really going on and they're all very receptive to this. I haven't had one negative encounter from a Jew. And if I do, I'm just like, I have no shame in educating him, being like, this is what your ancestors say, this is what the sages said, this is what's happening now, here's the picture. You could live in denial corner and just go and, you know, and live your best life as a hater, but this, you're not gonna ha your brain is not gonna influence the future of the world with that mindset. I think that's great, you know? I mean, and I, I hope that Kyrie, you know, can speak to you um, all the time. We gotta try to make that connection. I mean, I know Amari, I've been trying to make that connection as well. Um, I, I, there was one thing that we talked about a little bit in, in our in our pre-talk um, that was in the in the film, and it was talking about what the uh, original Hebrews looked like. Then going to like, what did Jesus look like, and what did you know? And and you asked an important question. You said, you know, he's like, why does it matter? And um, our response was that it matters because of the way that Christianity was contorted and twisted in America and used to enslave the minds and the bodies of uh, black people. So when they made Jesus white and they put him up on all the different, you know, every church you can worship here and, you know, that's akin to, to like master looks like the master and can keep you mentally subjugated and you know everything and then they started off with the curse of ham which i that's what i thought you was referring to and i was like wait a minute but you weren't referring to that as when you talk about the curses but the curse of ham that that the the film was also talking about a lot i think it was in chapter five um as far as that was used to justify slavery in america like that was that was where um Black people, it was destined for them to be in that situation. And so you have to understand the, the contortion of the history that we have had in this country as far as we're looking at the descriptions of, of the Hebrews. We're looking at the descriptions of Jesus. We're looking at you know all this, and then we see the deliberate switch and why it was done. And, you, and so then to understand, that kind of answers the question, why does it matter what Jesus looked like? Does that, does that make sense? Because we, we we talked about it a little bit, but then we didn't keep going with it. But I I did wanted to get get your response to that. Um, what did you What did you think about what I said? It makes a ton of sense. Again, um, you know that's not really an issue with the Jewish people, and I'll, I'll explain why. That seems like an issue with the church. And I explained to uh, Ron from uh, Mr. Dalton from the Hebrew Negroes documentary. I said it's a shame you had to put in all this work to prove your point that the original Israelites weren't white but our own teachings state that. So if you look at Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince, who wrote the Mishnah, wrote the laws of the people of Israel 2,000 years ago. For example, the Torah says to keep Shabbat. Well, how do I keep Shabbat? The Torah says, put a mezuzah on your doorpost. Well, what's a mezuzah? It says, wear tzitzit, wear fringes. What is that? The Torah doesn't tell you how to do anything. It just says to do it. So Rabbi Judah the Prince, 2,000 years ago, who traces back to the house of David, wrote down all the details of how we actually fulfill these commandments, how we do it, the details, the nuances of them. And that's really what Judaism is about. Judaism is just about the fulfillment of what the written law of Moses is. And one of these teachings in the Mishnah written 2,000 years ago by Judah the Prince states, the children of Israel were not white and they were not black, but they were boxwood. Um, I guess, you know, boxwood could be the color of, of your nose, um, you know, it looks like a boxwoody color to me. Oh, you said my nose? Okay, yeah. I got uh, you. That's a nice uh, solid boxwood we got going on over there. I got you. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, the children of Israel weren't white people. There's no question about that because we were taught that by our own sages. But it, the question is, at what point did DNA become so intermixed within the Israelites, you know, because Moses is marrying the daughter, daughter of a Midianite priest and uh, King Solomon has a thousand wives and there's, um, you know, 300 years before the common era, Greeks are already converting and serving in the temple of, and, you know, and becoming scholars. And we have bloodlines that led to King David from, from Aaron, from converts. It was all just a mixture of humans, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it would see, you know, like my family traces back to King David, but I'm a white guy with a red beard. The verse says King David was ruddy. He was reddish. 
a lot of debate. Well, you know, your your complexion could be a little reddish like Earth. You know, my complexion also could be a little reddish. So I was like, I didn't see the point of nuancing over all this because it was just, it was like Queens, New York. What color are the people of Queens, New York, and Brooklyn? Phew. <laughs> It's all a bunch of colors over there. So this is really what was going on with the House of Israel. But specifically with your case about the church, trying to make a white man your God and then saying you're a cursed people, mm -hmm. I think there's like a lot of false narratives in that that's manipulative that needs to be called out and addressed without the Jewish people feeling triggered by that, by you going at the church head to head. You know, well, that's not our fight. Yeah, you could argue with the church on the color of Jesus. That shouldn't have to have anything to do with I'm really from the house of Israel or not, you know? Um, because whether I'm a descendant of a convert or I'm the descendant of King David, according to the Torah, there's absolutely no difference. So don't make that the point of contention if I'm a pure bloodline or not. That would actually be a sin, according to the Torah, because the Torah says to love thy convert. So whoever the convert is, whether it's me or them, it's fine. But go you know, go to the church and, and, you know, have that conversation because, and also with the Jewish people, you know, they have the curse of Ham, which, you know, does say that um, the, there was a curse of uh, dark black skin in, in Africa and they would walk around naked. But at the same time, um, you see teachings, you know, from the Medrash that says the children of uh, Yafet were white and went to Europe and the children of Shame were dark and went to the Levant, the, you know, the Middle Eastern and African area, and Israel's part of the north of the, of the African continent. So, you know, we believe the Jewish people that the, the people of Ham and the Canaanites aren't even a nation anymore. I think this was written down almost a thousand years ago by the Rambam, by Maimonides, who was a rabbi in North Africa and went to Spain. He said that these people were, that curse isn't even relevant anymore. It's not a reality. So the Jewish people don't have in their lexicon the curse of Ham. We don't look at uh, Africans or African Americans as cursed people, and if a Jew does, it's because he's naive and is not aware of the, of what's really going on. He's just maybe filled with uh, prejudice, or it's comfortable for him to say that. But for the church to take that curse that has nothing to do with them, because if you look at all the church scriptures, these were written hundreds of years after the life of Jesus. Anyway, the Council of Nicaea was a bunch of pagan Roman guys who just put the whole thing, bundled it up, got rid of Sabbath, made you worship Sunday, gave you some Christmas trees, did all this stuff, and then said, you people are cursed. And they, they manipulated a whole entire narrative to put themselves in the position they did and to have power over you guys. And I think that needs to be called out. Um, but at the same time, you know, when you look at the story of, of the Bible and you see Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, right? And he went down to Egypt. And then he becomes second in power. He becomes ruler over Egypt. And then his brothers come down there. They don't know it's him, and he sets them up, and they're in the palace. And then they find out it's him. They're like, "Oh snap!" They were about. They were gonna like. They start crying. They were gonna like, "We're dead. He's gonna kill us." Mm -hmm. And Joseph's like, "Whoa, whoa, guys! This is all from God. Don't you see? God brought me here for a reason." So I think that the community has to start to choose. You know, from your end, which is who am I to say this? This is my perspective from my comfortable chair in the corner. But to say. If you believe you fulfilled this prophecy to come here on ships and play a role, then play the role. Don't point fingers at the people who put you there because it wasn't really them. It would have come from God, which uh, I don't think is really nice to say that all, you know, all the slavery and all the suffering came from God. But I say the same thing to my Jewish brothers on the Holocaust. You know, 6,000 million Jews said, I said, this is all from God. We can't, get, we can't take this personal against God. I can't even take this personal against a German. I have no hate in my heart for Germans, even though they did this to us. If I see a German, I just want to hug the guy to be like, it's over. We're good now, you know? So I, I think that there has to be uh, enough finger pointing at the enemy because that enemy will have zero power over you if you guys unite. But what you're fighting against is a, a strategy to divide and conquer your community. So the unification is the hardest part. So the finger pointing is much easier. But if you guys united, no one would stand a chance. It'd be game over. Well, my answer to that would be that it's a little bit easier for you to say that. As I said. <laughs> while, while, well, no, let me finish. Like, like it's, it's easier for you to say that as you are as you were awarded Israel. And I say that because when you're looking at the, you know, you're like, okay, you believe that, that, that this traces, and I believe that my traces are here and we could have a different belief in a different, different belief in who is, I remember, I, I remember in college reading Alan Dershowitz, the case for Israel. And one of the things that he said 
was the rightful place. It was it was right for you to be in Israel because you were the original people. You were the original this. You were the, and used the same language, just the opposite way that Dalton used in the documentary. Is that fair to say? No, I don't think so. But he didn't say when he said you, he wasn't referring to Europeans. The 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 statement, the official declaration of the state of Israel is a, is a haven for the return of all of the house of Israel to return home and be safe. Now, what defines someone from the house of Israel, right. there are measures where you're keeping the commandments, the 613 commandments of the Torah. So if you lost your way and you were from the house of Israel and you want to come back, no problem. Just adhere to the 613, go dip in the water, put the name, you know, Jew on you and you're in. I haven't seen that as much. I saw. I haven't seen like so you're talking about converts, and I've seen. I know that when we talked before, that's how it should be, and that's how you were uh, commanded to be, as far as not to, to separate a convert or be able to make a strife between bloodline and convert. Correct. But but as far as Israel, it didn't seem like it was convert because there are plenty of, you know, people who have had a lot of difficulty, a lot of struggle, a lot of, a lot of, have gone through a lot of hate, a lot of having to be moved out of African descent who are Jews in Israel, in modern day Israel. Oh, so no and, question. So, yeah. But they are Jews. They are, they are, whether you think that they're convert or whether they're, you know, whatever. So that, that, that isn't the case that has happened in Israel consistently enough to be able to say it's a regular practice, right? No, for sure. But so look at, for example, you know, the the conversion of the Ethiopians and they brought them out to Israel where they were suffering. They were going through their own, uh, you know, genocides and being murdered um, in Ethiopia. And they were converted and brought back to Israel and made safe, which was a phenomenon, I think a beautiful thing. But you are 1000% right. There's systematic racism in the, the structure of the European mentality of Israel. That, um, that, you know, the Jews of Demona, the black Hebrew uh, Israelites from Chicago that came to Demona and became the village of peace under Ben Ami. Actually, if you see Ben Ami, I got him right on my wall over here. I got my Ben Ami award. He was the spiritual leader of the Demona community. I show respect for him. That they're treated very poorly. Their children are serving in the Israeli army and they're not being given citizenship and they're being threatened to get kicked out of the land. Right. And uh, the Igbo community, you know, who did come and they're in Tel Aviv, they're all getting treated very poorly. Um, yes. Even myself gets treated poorly here, being um, what they call the term is like a friar, like, you know, excuse my language, like a sucker. You know, I'm like a, an American nice guy. So there's people who would, you know, want to take advantage of me and take advantage of that. It's a very traumatized Middle Eastern harsh reality out here. And my hopes is that a uh, fresh generation comes in and starts to take control over our homeland. So um, I have political aspirations. I hope the people on my team do. I want to see a, a government leadership of Israel, of Jews made up from the B'nai Menashe community, from south of China, North India, from um, from the Ethiopian community, from the Venezuelan, South American community. I want to see a unified group of leaders that aren't just from one specific remnant of the Jewish exile from certain Polish countries, that are still, you know, ruling using Ottoman Turkish draconian laws in the land here. The whole thing has got to get revamped, but this goes back to what my ancestors warned me about, that the final battle of the Jewish people is within the Jewish people. It's, our, it's within ourselves. So I'm not here to defend my people um, who are not keeping true to the word of God and the Torah and practicing these things. I'm not here to defend those individuals. I'm here to make sure that they don't have a position of power over this beautiful homeland, which was designed to be a light onto the nations, to the whole world, and we have to act that way. So, I, I, I when when I was, um, I think it was like one of my my rookie year, or my second year in the NBA. I um, I participated in a Seeds of Peace camp. I don't know if you know what that is. It's in Maine, and they bring Israeli kids and Palestinian kids together, and they they have them. Um, go through these different workshops and these different, you know, they might have games, they might play ball, they might go through um, some different talking sessions, things of that nature. And kind of like to not see the person that you've been taught is your enemy as your enemy. It's an amazing camp. 
right? Absolutely amazing experience. And I remember, and I'll never forget it, this, this young, she was like 11 year old Palestinian girl. And I was sitting there talking to them, listening to them, um, learning, being educated by them. They were lecturing me, you know what I mean? They were 11, but they're not like a regular American 11. They're a different kind of 11. And she said something to me that has always stuck with me. Um, and we was talking about the violence that was going on there and is Israel and Palestine and the war and you know one thing one side you know does something one side does another one who has a support who has the support from America why America has that support what was established everything breaking down everything right and she said something to me that always stuck with me and she said you know terrorism is in the eye of the beholder and I could never get that out of my mind because what she was saying to me was that for them, the terrorists are Israel and America. And she explained why. She said, we're not allowed to have a government. We're not allowed to protect ourselves. We're not allowed, anything that we do is, is thrown into the bucket of terrorism. And then on top of that, you know, we were here and they said, well, it is our rightful place to be here. You all have to move. We agreed on settlements. Those settlements start getting pushed back. They, we, we, somebody throws a rock at them and they come with, you know, rockets and everything like that. And they decimate, you know, whole hospitals. Everything. So she's going through. Now, remember, these are 11 years old, year olds. And that's when I really started researching a lot. And I got to say, a lot of the treatment of the Palestinians, if anything, that has done some of the most to... make it difficult for any type of relationship between modern day Israel and anyone. Because it does seem like all of Israel is on one accord. It does seem like it's okay when this happens and Israel has the right to defend itself. And those are the things that you hear no matter what happens. Do you know what I mean? So then it's like, well, if I'm connecting to this, to what your Torah teaches you, you're supposed to be with your neighbor. It's kind of the opposite. So you understand where it's it's a little bit difficult. Like when we talk about trying to bring people together and things like that, there's certain things that make it a little bit difficult. But I do believe that having discussions like this that we're having are, are very important. But I want to ask you, where do you fall on that, on the Palestinians, on the treatment, on how they're, they're they've been historically treated, on who's rightfully supposed to be there. And if it was their land before 1948, if they were there, whatever they were doing on the land, if they were there before 1948, then you kind of move there, push them out. Like, where, where are you on that entire discussion? Okay, it's a loaded question. And it's we'll definitely loaded. I'm sorry, it was a loaded question. Right. Question because I have a unique perspective on it, but, um, you know, cut me off or interject if you have any questions. And uh, first and foremost, you said before that Israel was gifted to the Jewish people. So yeah, there was a period where it was United Nations declared it was the homeland for the Jewish people, but it wasn't like the Jewish people showed up out of nowhere. If you actually look for the 2000 year exile, there was never a generation without a Jewish presence in the land of Israel. So if you actually look at the community in Sfat, you know, northern Israel in the 1400s, this is where all the Kabbalistic mystical books were written down by the Jewish community. You know, in the year 1000, we had sages there. In the year 600, we were there. In the year 300, in the year 1800, there was historical books and evidence of Jewish establishments in the land of Israel this whole entire time. Um, in, you know, well before Zionism and the Holocaust, there was waves of people from Europe um, going to reinforce the communities that have been there since the 1400s. And so the interesting thing is that there's no such thing as, uh, let's say, a Palestinian people. And this is uh, from the Palestinians. Well, hear me out. This is what the Palestinians on the ground would say. Um, Palestine, Palestine was a term that was referred to the land of Israel when Rome kicked out the Judeans. And so, and then the verse says in the scripture that a lot of the people were left in the land to till the grapes and to till the mountains. So the Palestinians are actually a large group of unified Arabic speaking family clans from different clans that go back that are not united bloodline, but are united by uh, the teachings of Muhammad. So a lot of them come from Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, 
you know, for a thousand years, they were in their different family clans. And what unites them is that they're Ar Arabic speaking people who are Muslim. So this is not my, this is what I learned from their perspective, you know. But if, if you know, you said you do the research. This is interesting research someone should do. The majority of the terrorist attacks in Israel, the stabbings, are coming not from um, Palestinians who are authentically Muslim. They're coming from ones that were once Jewish who went through forced conversions by force to Islam. Now, Islam works uh, mostly that if you, you either convert to become Islamic or you have to pay certain taxes or you could be made into a slave, which is where a lot of the transatlantic slave trade had you know, its roots in the Muslim slave trade. And so you see there's communities in Israel, and this is not my theory, this is, look it up on the internet, these are videos, documentaries done about this, and the, these are communities, not individuals, family clans and tribes who were once Jewish, who have Judaic items hidden under floorboards and stuff, they're the ones really going around stabbing Jews. There's actually a derogatory term used for these Arabs in Israel today, it's called Musta Arabim, like you're a fake Arab, you're not a real Arab. You are, uh, you know, like a Murano would be used for someone from the Spanish Inquisition who pretended to be Christian, who was really Jewish, you know, they said convert to Christianity or die, so they converted and pretended. It was a derogatory term called Murano. So there's a large group, I think 25% of the Palestinians in Israel have Jewish roots who went through conversions, but they're making up the majority of the terrorist attacks. So there's like already something going on that's um, not being, you know, spoken about. Another elephant in the room over here. And there's no question that this land is the land of the people of Israel, of the Torah, you know, the land of the, the Muslims and the Koran span from Jordan all the way to the end of Afghanistan and up to Lebanon and down into Egypt. They have more land. Israel is the size of New Jersey, and it's a place where the Torah could be safe and the people of Israel could be safe, and that's where it should be. But that absolutely is not an excuse for anyone living like the way these people in Gaza live and these people in these areas live. Um, but there are, you know, like you said, it's in the eye of the beholder from these little kids waking up to rockets coming from Israeli planes. That's all they know. That's all they see. But why is Israel destroying hospitals? You know, the world's giving millions and billions of dollars to these, uh, the Gazan government. And with that money, they're investing in rockets and putting those rockets behind hospitals and shooting at Israel from it. And I was in 2006 when Lebanon shot rockets at the spot. You know, I had to hide on the floor, rockets flying over my head. At first, I thought it was the, the you know, the F-16s breaking the sound barrier, but then I realized we're under attack. And so I know what it feels like to have rockets rained on you. And so these Palestinian leadership, they take all this money and they spend it on rockets and they put it by hospitals. And Israel has, no, has nothing to do but to, like you said, to defend itself. But I obviously, this is the narrative I'm being told. So I don't know what it's like for them. Let me, let me just interject real quick. But to be fair, you know, uh, how much does America give Israel every year? Well, behind the scenes, I think America benefits off that as well. So it's not no, but I'll just say, how much do they give them every year? You know, how many hundreds of millions of dollars of military? Millions. Bill, yeah, with a so, so, so Israel right now has the, besides America, you know, besides the United States, their army, their national, everything is probably the most powerful, correct? Well, it's probably the most powerful well, army because they make the chips that every other army is using and they could probably just shut it down with a moment's notice if they wanted to. You know, these guys are... <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying you have the, the most powerful, so you're kind of not, not really comparing, you know, apples to apples if you say that, you know, Palestine has some donations of some people around the world comparing to what the United States alone gives Israel every year, right? Yeah, for sure. My personal opinion on it, you know, I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist or whatnot, but I run this by the Jewish people, is anytime there's a fear or an enemy, it creates a need for governance and for rule. And uh, the way that the Israeli government seems to run is through control and fear. So I think it's uh, in the government of Israel's today best interest to have this enemy put into the corner that always keeps us uh, needing uh, them to be in power. You know, that's a psychological thing. And I think that with the right leadership that could take... The, the government of Israel was built in a way that it can be taken down and reestablished in a new way overnight. I don't know if you saw, we're like, we just had our fifth or sixth elections in like a short amount of time because it's not terms. It's if we lose confidence, we take the whole thing down and restart the whole thing. But the funding doesn't stop regardless of what of how you restructure it. So, so, so what, 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 but let me ask, would, would a two state solution be something that's even possible? Um, you know, as accepted because, or, or what would it be honored? 
So, so what I've been reading, I've just like I've read Alan Dershowitz, a case for Israel. I read, what was it Michael Nan, um, case for Palestine, and he was saying why the two state solution was was rejected and what it would do, and what was the fear. So when you said earlier, you know, I can't even. What did you say? I don't want to misquote you, but um, Palestine is not a, a real place or real people, or something like that. But that was that was the fundamental um, issue with a lot of people in Israel of why they don't recognize Palestine as being a place. Even going back to the Seas for Peace, when I'm in there with the sessions with them, and I remember this one little Israeli boy um, said, we can't even start talking if we're talking about a place that doesn't exist. And I saw the, 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 the wind be taking out all of the Palestinian kids where how are we even supposed to talk if you don't even acknowledge my existence? Do you know what I'm saying? So it, that that part. The issue is as follows: that is, like I said, 25% of the Palestinians were in the land from ancient times who went through forced conversions. There's a large percentage of the Palestinian people who showed up um, in the in more recent years from Lebanon, from Egypt, and from Jordan, whose families go back to those regions. Um, those parts of the world won't even accept these individuals anymore. It's much more convenient to keep them as refugees. They're not allowed back into other Muslim countries even. And um, there was no Palestinian leadership, flag, government, people. that It didn't exist at a certain point in the last, you know, 70 or 80 years. It popped up out of nowhere. Um, so they have to be represented as something. But the two-state solution, from my perspective, it's clear in the prophecies that, you know, the people in the end times are going to try to divide Jerusalem in two. And God's going to come out and be like, it's not going to happen. You don't divide my capital into two. This is the capital of... Of Jerusalem, yeah, there will be a righteous government and a righteous people and a unified people, but there won't be. Is not going to be a divided situation, and then a, and then a random band of different tribes from different regions are going to be represented as rulership over the land where we have to build a temple for all humans to come and worship and pray in the future. So it's not out of hate, but I think that Israel. But you do understand how problematic that is, because if they're not as not even coming up as a solution, then the only solution then is to push them completely off the face of the. The solution should be uh, to live as free citizens and behave and enjoy the rights of Israel. I mean, first of all, if you go to the what mall. What do you mean? Does behave a two way street or is it? Is it? I mean, you're, 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 you're using certain language of, you know, I, I don't want to say. To, to say that that is the requirement, it has to be two ways. It has to be. So if you have a treaty or something like that that you both agree to, then it has to stay up. But now, but if it's if it's we agree to this, but now you're pushing further and want to have more settlements. Right. And now we're pushing a little bit further over here and want to have more settlements. Right. When I say behave, I just mean historically, the Jewish people never historically attacked another people with violence. You know, maybe we could use our cunning to manipulate with money or whatever, you know, to, it could be even worse, but we never violently hurt anyone. And um, we, ha if you want to give me an example, you could let me know where all the things that's happened. So, so the the response is always that okay, you know, if like like I said, what what so far so far was, and I remember her name, who was explaining to me at, at the camp. She was like, you know, somebody throws a rock over there, and they and they and they return with rockets, and that's and then you say, okay, well, they threw a rock first, so that's why we we didn't attack first. That we, and I'm like, well. It's a little bit disproportionate, isn't it? I mean, no, it's not a rock. It's rock. It's rockets. You know, if, uh, there's an app in Israel that you have called the Rocket app. That when rockets get fired towards Jerusalem, you know, we all have to run into bunkers. So me and my pregnant, you know, wife, we're running down into bunkers and hiding. And then even Israel, we like get upset at the government. We're like, where's the response? Where's the retaliation? Nothing. Israel, two, three days of rockets. Then Israel goes in and starts leveling places that the rockets are coming from. Um, so I think that there is a lot of media ma manipulation of what's actually happening. But these people are living horrible lives in garbage, filthy places without electricity. So I'm not taken away from their condition of living. But when I was saying behave before, I just meant like, I don't want to be stabbed when I'm walking around. Like, I'm not going to stab you, don't stab me. But you're right, there are places where we need law and order, where there's the wild west of Israel, the West Bank, where whose land is who, whose olive grove is this? These guys are uprooting their olive trees and they're throwing stones at each other. The Jews are throwing stones first, the Arabs are throwing stones back. And But there's no rockets over there. So there's like different pockets of different conflict it seems to me that the government of Israel is like nicely, happily that it's all happening because now they get have to be in control because there's a fear and there's an enemy. So, you know, I have compassion on the Palestinian people, quote unquote. I want them to have equal rights as citizens. And I was saying before, 
the the Arabic speaking people of Israel enjoy a freedom here way more than in other Arabic speaking countries. You know that the woman here could drive and you go to the malls, they're filled with Arab people and we get along. You know, my taxi driver's Arab. There's no issue. There's love on the ground. We're all enjoying the freedom here, but there's a higher level of government manipulation that's it seems like keeping this ongoing uh, for whatever manipulative reasons that we have to definitely put an end to. Well, I think, I think it's a lot similar to, you know, before we're here and then with the Native Americans when, you know, the settlers came, um, invaded their, their, their land, and they, you know, then charged them with being violent or savages and said, okay, well, if you behave nicely, then we can kind of, you know, coexist. But if you don't, then we have to be able to do this. And there was a government, like you said, a government entity that, that wanted to continue that strife to be able to justify being able to take more of their land, being able to, you know, to do all of these different things. Um, and that's part of it. But then you, you got to be able to understand why, you know, it's like, okay, I've done this and now I want you to live peacefully with me. No, I think it's similar, but on the flip side. So imagine if the Native Americans, you know, went almost extinct and kicked out of the land and then all of a sudden had a comeback tour after like thousands of years, came back to New York, was like, we're resurrecting our language. We're taking back our land. You New Yorkers, Americans, you could choose to behave and stay with us as we take control over here. So I think that's what happened in Israel. That the Jewish people, like I said, never left. And this was for 2,000 years, we were crying every day, three times a day, crying to return to this land and, and, and reestablish it in peace. And finally, when we come back, there's people trying to convert us and murder us. And, and you know, there was like pogroms where Arabs were literally, and you look at Hebron, massacring Jews prior to any formation of any army of Jewish army or any Zionistic beliefs. We were being raped and massacred in the land here. And it comes to the point where we've been raped around every land in the world and we're coming back to our homeland and we're very gently and casually, I guess they're not doing it so gentle now, going to say, don't mess with us on our land anymore. We're catching our breath. So if I saw the Native Americans have a comeback tour, come to New York, reestablish their sacred spaces and allow New Yorkers to participate it if they so choose to go with what the Native Americans um, believed should be, you know, going on. I think that'd be beautiful. That'd be a beautiful story. And I think that's the story of Israel. As beautiful as it is, there's a very dark underlying beast within it that we're going to have to uproot. And that's going to be the hard battle that we're going to have to fight. And we should fight it together. And the, and the, the beast goes, this is long just establishing the, the, the dark underlying beast goes both ways, right? It's not just one side that's a dark underlying beast. It's, it's a both ways type of a dark underlying beast. And just trying to be clear. I'm saying within the Jewish people, according to our legends, there is some dark underlying beast that has to be dealt with and addressed that, you know, it seems that if you try to speak about it, you'll be called anti-Semitic. If course. I speak about it, I could actually rouse the Jewish people to come together and say, let's let's do this, you know? I got you. I got you. That's why it's imperative we do it together. I'm not so concerned about the Palestinian issue. These people aren't even... Most of them don't even want an Arabic government to rule over them. They're like, what, do you want us to be like Saudi Arabia where a woman can't drive? We enjoy the freedom. We just want to have equal rights as you guys that I should be able to travel equally and have all these things. All right, no problem. That should be something that gets worked out. And um, I believe in that they should have good quality of life, you know, at least the electric. And, and I, I mean, I think they have to be, you know, acknowledged as a, a, a country in order to be able to get that. You know what I mean? They have to, whether they're, I mean, not necessarily saying that it has to be under a Sharia law, but it has to be Palestine. And it has to be that they're governing their, under their- Well, Palestine. if there is Palestine, it will be Sharia law and they're, you know, their homosexuals will get stoned and their kids- And why, and why do you come to that conclusion of what uh, the actual- Because it will give them a chance to, for self-governance and that's what happened. That's what Hamas is. And that's what these organizations that rule over them, these are extremist organizations that do not tolerate any modern the liberalist thinking and freedom of thought. But when you give somebody no option and no form of way to formulate their own government, can they... They have elections. Uh, the Palestinians in Gaza have elections in the West. And they have no power. Do they have any power uh, uh, with, when, when, you, when, you, when, when, when Israel and Palestine go to war? Is it an equal fight? <laughs> Israel's not never the initiator on the wars. All the wars that Israel won was defense winnings, and uh, you know, which is a miracle. You know, the Six-Day War and these Yom Kippur Wars... These were all uh, miracles when Egypt attacked and Jordan attacked and Lebanon attacked. They got attacked from all sides and God was with them. There was miracles. They won these wars. And Israel is very, you know, don't mess with us. We'll defend ourselves to the T, but we're not a really aggressors. Um, you know, outside of like, yeah, yeah, rocks thrown here and there. 
but these individuals, they're not looking for Sharia law. They're just looking for freedom. And I think there's an opportunity here for them for that. We just need a government that could have enough compassion on them to provide them with, the, you know, like I said, some basics, just even electricity and clean running, running water and, um, you know, to be able to redo their homes and, you know, and live comfortably. But like I said, these guys are, are trying to go into other countries. Their neighbors, Jordan, won't accept them. Egypt won't accept them. And they're from their families. Same last name, same tribe, same clan. They're not accepted. They're no, no one wants to take them in. So, And why, and why do you, why do you and, and we don't have to accuse them all this because it is a complicated topic. This has been debated, you know, for, for I'm decades. Sure, yeah, but, I'm sure I have my biases that I'll have to humble myself on. Yeah, right, right. right. And I'm, and I, but I am, I am, I will say I am thankful that we could calmly have a discussion like this. I know I keep saying it, but it's really the truth because these conversations are conversations that people are, that avoid so much in the States. And they just want to say, no, this is right. This is wrong. If you're, if you have anything against me, then you're anti me. Do you know what I mean? Or, or like, so say for instance, Kyrie has to go and meet with the ADL. I have a lot of issues with the ADL and I, and I don't know if you do. And we, if, if you do this, but I have a lot of issues with the ADL and their definitions of what exactly is anti-Semitic. And it's there, I'll let you, what, 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 how do you see the ADL? I would rather an organization called like the Pro Redemption League, you know, um, that takes opportunities like this and moves forward and not backwards. So I think that the ADL is probably, you know, I'd want to look into where all their funding is coming from and whose agenda that they're promoting and protecting mm -hmm. and get to the bottom of it. I haven't had the, the wherewithal to do all that investigating yet because I'm trying not to pay heed to the hate. I'm just like, I know for sure that if the love unites, the hate will just flow away in the wind. I don't have to give them my time or my energy. So mm -hmm. I look at the ADL as an archaic entity of the past that's not going to be needed in the future because there's not going to be a need to hate against the people of Israel because the purpose of the people of Israel is to be a light onto the world. So. If we're not acting as a light onto the world, there's an issue within us. So like, don't look at, don't silence other people. Look within ourselves, self, self reflect. But why people don't look at us and see us as a light onto the world? So instead of focusing on the ADL, which I, you know, have nothing to do with, would never affiliate myself with, um, I would just focus on taking advantage of the situation. So I would say to Kyrie, link up with, don't go to the ADL. That's that's like not the move. Go to the Jewish people. Come sit with me. The ADL can't call me anti-Semitic. They can't cancel me. I would love a little, you know, come on ADL, like what do you got? This is this is the redemption unfolding. We got the tribes waking up. What do you have for us now? They don't, they're not built for this conversation. They don't want the redemption to unfold. They want the Jewish people to stay these, you know, uh, Eurocentric Jews and we'll allow some ingathering to happen among selective converts. And you guys have nothing to do with this. Don't even touch it with a 10-foot pole. And if you do, you're going to lose your money. You're going to lose your job. You may even get banned from social media. And um, that is, they're, they're like a bully almost in the room, not allowing healthy conversation to happen. And, um, and I'm so grateful I found you, a good man who reached out to me to, uh, and I've been looking. If you look at my social media and my posts for the last 10, 12 years, I'm calling out to the African-American community. Who's in? Who's going to work together? Are we going to build? And I had to get through a lot of hate, a lot of people calling me imposters to try to convince them that love is the only way through this whole thing. Um, so, you know, here we are 2022, and we're still making power moves. So I'm excited to replace the ADL with, the, what I said, the Pro Redemption League, you know, so it's, we can we can work with Kanye and, and Kyrie and have them be ambassadors for goodness in the world, and uh, be labeled as righteous. I think that one of the things that would definitely help, just as a um, as some input and suggestion, um, is that you convince more people to talk the way that you talk and acknowledging. And I, I made that analogy earlier that you know you you talked about the how hurtful it was and why there's such a strong reaction from Hebrews to Negroes because they kept saying the words imposters and fake. And um, and I made the correlation to the, the, the same hurt and the same pain of not even acknowledging. You know what I mean? The, 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 the like you said, as far as the Bantus Igbo people and the connection and everything, not even acknowledging why Kyrie says that he is a Semite or what his, his research is showing him, or in finding himself, and finding his roots, and a connection 
to his roots and where and not even acknowledging it just that you know it's anti-semitic apologize end the story you know what i mean Rob will be with the adl and then that's it and that that doesn't do anything to to improve any type of relationship so that would be um what what i would suggest that more people i mean this conversation that we just had was great i mean we didn't always agree i mean we we sat here and talked for what is an hour and a half and we 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 agreed some points we disagreed you presented one i presented something else we, we sometimes we met in the middle sometimes we didn't but these conversations i believe are important to have if you have any chance of being able to unite so i just want to encourage you to continue um doing everything that you're doing i mean the fact when you when, when i was when i read that you linked with the the marley's and took them to to um you know to jerusalem that's amazing you're linking with with um Amari and and sitting down with him and everything. I thought that was amazing. And I and I, I want you to be able to link with Kyrie as well. And again, it's not a um when when a lot of people are saying that they want Kyrie to go speak to a rabbi, what they really are saying is that they want him to sit down and be lectured to to a rabbi because he doesn't know and he's so ignorant and he doesn't know. You know, that's you have a discussion like what we just had. We just had a discussion. And I, I just I just want to you know commend you on that. And tell you just to you know keep that up, and I and I think that we, I would like to move forward um, with you on a lot of different projects. So I want us to talk a little bit offline as far as how we can continue to move because I think more conversations like this need to be had, um, and bringing in more people uh, that need to be that need to have this conversation. Now, as far as um, you know, it's interesting because sometimes agendas have to be left. To the side and having an honest conversation but it's really it's really tough sometimes to pick who to have that conversation with that doesn't have this, the agendas whatever those agendas are would you agree for sure very very tricky definitely definitely so hey i want i want to appreciate you um for for taking the time um you know here on, on the rematch and I, I really did enjoy this conversation i think this was a great conversation to have so i, I just want to say thanks again and i'll give you the last word i appreciate that yeah so you're just saying you know the right conversation with the right people um i've been praying you know to the creator of the most high that this Kyrie and Kanye situation is uh, leads to an opportunity of more good in the world and more unification more unity and less lecturing and punishment and and uh you know, I'm, I'm on the bench, ready to get called in when the time's right. You know, I don't know if I'm sure, you know, I'm seeing since the Kyrie thing, so many people are posting my lectures and tagging me and their and their stories. Maybe Kyrie saw what I said, some of the things I said, maybe he didn't, I don't know yet. But uh, if there's any way to get in touch with any of these guys, I will make sure they don't have to apologize to anyone. Um, there will be apologies in the world, but it's not going to be coming from the community who's been oppressed for so long in this country, just trying to get some spiritual clarity on situations. They deserve all that information, and uh, they should, you know, we should give it to them in a silver spoon. So that's it for me. Um, you know, I'm on Rabbi Harry on Instagram if anyone wants to reach out. I appreciate your time. I do believe this is the beginning of a very long and healthy conversation that should lead to justice and the fulfillment of the prophecies of old of a global family and world peace. Thank you, thank you, I really appreciate it. So um, be safe and thanks again for coming on the rematch. All right. Thank you, shalom.